Welcome to a conversation today about dog behavior and specifically dog body language. I'm Laura Sharkey. I am the owner of Wolf's Dog Training Center in Arlington, Virginia, and this is definitely one of my most favorite topics. Um, I am going to share my slides with you all to start with. Hopefully everybody's good to see that. Um, the title of my talk today is Listen With Your Eyes. And the reason I call it that is because dogs talk with their bodies, not with a voice, obviously. Um, they have plenty of vocalizations, barks, whines, cries, etc. Uh, but most of their communication is through body language. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about today or, or mention just as we get started, uh, as my title says, this is an introduction to dog body language. I could do an entire semester on dog body language um, and then an additional semester on dog behavior. So this is uh, by no means a comprehensive study of dog body language, but it is something I am hoping that will give everybody a, uh, a start on or, uh, you know, just to, to start practicing listening with your eyes. So the first thing I want to tell you is that there is a difference between behavior and body language. We all behave and all behavior happens for a reason. So if I scratch my face like I am right now, you can assume that I'm scratching it for a reason. And the reason is that I have an itch. If I move the hair out of my face, I'm using my hand to move my hair. It's probably because the hair is irritating me or getting in my eye. If I stretch, uh, it's maybe I'm tired or a little bit sore, right? So everything an animal, including a human animal, does, all this behavior happens for a very specific reason. Obviously, the corollary to that is behavior is not random, and it doesn't happen for no reason. And I want everybody to remember that whenever you say, well, he did that for no reason, or he's barking at nothing. Your dog is never barking at nothing. Whether or not you can perceive what they're barking at is a different question. So just remember, all behavior is happening for a reason, and it is not random. It is not just, they just are barking for no reason. It's, it's, it doesn't happen. The other point I wanna make is that Body language is a subset of animal behavior. When I'm scratching my ear because my ear is itchy or I am putting on pants because my legs are cold, those behaviors aren't designed to communicate anything to anybody else. Those are my internal behaviors to adjust my internal state, to solve an itch, to make myself warm, etc. So those are behaviors that have nothing to do with communication. What I wanna to talk to you specifically today is about what we call body language, which is a subset of animal behavior that is specifically designed for communication. And then the last thing is Understanding your dog's body language, basically what they're saying, can vastly improve your relationship with your dog. So it can suddenly make something that seemed utterly mis uh, unable to, for, you, for you to understand to become understandable. And if you can figure out what your dog is trying to say, you can have a better relationship. So I want to talk about body language 101. Really important to remember, your dog is always watching you and interpreting your behavior. How many, uh, this is a kind of a rhetorical question, but how many of you get up, move across the room 
and your dog gets up and follows you, right? You didn't call them, you didn't tell them where you were going, but yet there they are, right? Your dog is constantly watching your body language and trying to pick up signals from you that tell them what you're gonna do next. Does it all involve them? Um, is it good for them or bad for them? Uh, so they're always watching you and always interpreting your behavior, even if you're not watching them. Dogs are emotionally intelligent, right? So they can be scared, they can be sad, they can be excited and happy. Um, we know this about, scientifically we know this for the basic emotions. Um, what is still under uh, observation and uh, study is uh, deeper, more complex emotions, but what you really need to know is your dog can be emotionally affected by how you interact with them. And of course, all animals prefer, prefer to be listened to. If anybody has ever been in a relationship where they felt they weren't listened to, you understand how frustrating and irritating and sometimes uh, infuriating <laughs> it can be to not be listened to. So your dog will appreciate you if you are able to listen to them and understand what they're trying to say. Lastly, if you are their person, they are talking to you, okay? You're the number one person that they are trying to communicate with. And it would be great if we could do the best we possibly can uh, to know what they're saying. Now, we often say that humans primarily communicate through speech. And I would say that that's not true. I would say that humans have a very extensive body language and it is probably equally important as the words that come out of your mouth. Um, and everybody who has ever had a misunderstanding through text messages understands that often without the subtle body language or intonation cues that we use to communicate, our message can be easily misinterpreted. So here you can see um, these gentlemen are not saying anything to you. We cannot hear them, but there is absolutely no doubt about what these guys are saying. Um, Smiley on the left there, he's having a really good day. I don't know, he's on a nice hike in the mountains or he's having a picnic or maybe he's throwing a frisbee for his dog. I don't know what he's doing. It doesn't matter. I can tell that he's happy. Uh, screamy on the right, not having such a good day, right? Something has irritated this gentleman uh, quite substantially. And if you look in detail, we can start to pick out the features that tell us what's wrong. So, okay, they both have a face, they both have hair, they both have um, some absolutely uh, intentional stubble. <laughs> However, oh, they both have their mouth open, mouths open, and both of their eyes are kind of scrunched closed. So there's a lot of similarities. Yet nobody would say that these two people look you know, that much alike. So this guy's mouth, uh, the, the gentleman on the left, can, can you all see my cursor? Can somebody give me a yes or no? I think no. I think no, okay. So the gentleman on the left um, has a soft mouth and soft squinty eyes, right? There are no lines on his face. He's sort of smooth, except for he's got some adorable smile lines. Um, the guy on the right has some intense uh, neck lines and neck wrinkles or um, stress marks on his neck and in between his eyes, between his eyebrows. 
um, his his mouth is wide wide open it's not um, sort of soft it's hard I would say it's really intentionally white so obviously serious body language differences and it's those small things that I just pointed out the lines in his neck his really scrunched eyes the lines between his eyebrows his really wide open mouth um, humans we take all that information in as one picture that says this man is angry or frustrated or screaming for some reason. Um, but we take all those individual pieces and we put them together really, really fast, instantaneously. And our brain then tells us how to interpret that. Keep in mind that wolves and chimps have very different languages, very different body languages. And if we want a wolf to understand a chimp or a chimp to understand a wolf, we are going to expect that there is some translational difficulty here because they are completely different species. Not at all dissimilar to dogs and humans. I think it is because we have um, had dogs for, I don't know, some estimates say 20 to 40,000 years alongside humans that we have taken them for granted and we no longer appreciate or marvel at the level of communication these two species and the level of um, love and affection and uh, enjoyment that these two species get from each other. And I think it is would be good for everybody to remember that, wow, this is interspecies communication. And because it comes so easily between dogs and humans, I think we tend to, we, we forget to marvel at that um, and also to acknowledge uh, the potential difficulties. Uh, let me just go back one second. This, these two faces are sort of equivalent. You have an adorable little happy dog and there's our happy gentleman on his picnic. Um, same things. We're going to look at the same things in the dog that we're going to look that we automatically see in the human. So we're going to see the soft open mouth, right? We're going to see the soft eyes. Um, the human isn't telling us very much about his ears, but the dog has lovely little prick ears that say, hey, I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm listening, I'm attentive, I'm happy. Uh, his body language says his, his body um, is not stiff. He looks really quite relaxed lying there in the grass. And these are the things that you have to start breaking down into individual pieces and look at at the dog. So, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna look at his ears, his eyes, his mouth, his body. Does he have wrinkles? We can't see his tail in this picture, but the tail is also really important. Is his body stiff or is his body soft? <clears throat> and I would, I recently did, um, we did a lot of body language work with the apprentices at Whoops Dog Training. Um, and I think we spent an hour on each body part. So an hour looking at ears and an hour looking at tails and an hour looking at faces and an hour looking at bodies, right? So it takes a lot of study to get really good and to be able to see these things really quickly and interpret them like we can when we look at a human. Now, you don't need to speak dog to know what these two dogs are saying. Again, we've been, you know, living and evolving with dogs for 40,000 years. Um, and somewhere along the lines, we have figured out that the dog, um, the little white dog, is super happy. And the dog on the right is pretty angry and potentially dangerous. So that we see really, really easily. Um, it's, it's quite obvious.
what I'm here to talk to you about today is mostly the in-between, okay? So there's a gentleman and he's got his hand on the side of the face of this dog. And the dog doesn't look like the happy dog and he doesn't look like the really angry dog. Uh, and I'm hoping most of you can see, what I see is that this dog looks nervous or sad or concerned. Um, you know, we can't actually speak to them, so I don't know exactly what words the dog would use to describe what he or she is feeling. Um, but I can tell you just from this still picture that that dog isn't having a good moment. How can I tell this? Well, the dog's mouth is closed. It doesn't even look like this dog has ears, right? These ears are pinned back so far against his head um, that I can't even see them. The eyes are round, not almond shape. There's little furrows. He's got little black eyebrow patches. Um, and those like look like they're kind of coming together in the center and are a little furrowed. They're definitely not relaxed. You can imagine the musculature under the eyebrows kind of being clenched. The mouth is closed, um, which sometimes means nothing. But in this case, I would say it's very, very meaningful. Um, and a couple of things about this picture. If this is your dog, and let's imagine that this gentleman and this dog have recently entered the dog park. You absolutely need to listen to what your dog is saying and believe them. This dog is saying, I am currently incredibly uncomfortable. But often we will interpret this differently and somebody might say, hey, what's the matter with Rex? And you might say, oh, he's fine. He loves being at the dog park. This dog isn't saying that he loves being there right now. Or a discerning owner might say, huh, you're right. I don't know. He's really upset about something. I'm just going to take him home, OK? And the difference between these two responses is that one of them is paying attention to how the dog is feeling right this moment, right? They're looking at the dog in the moment and believing what they are saying. This dog is uncomfortable. We're gonna do something else. Maybe we need to go home. Maybe he's not feeling well. Maybe there's a dog he's afraid of. We don't know exactly the reason, but we can say that this dog categorically is uncomfortable. And the simplest explanation for what you're seeing is usually the correct interpretation. If you think your dog looks scared, they're probably scared. If you think your dog seems happy, they're probably happy, right? What happens though is that we humans have these big frontal lobes and we like to apply previous knowledge or previous experience to what we're seeing now as a way of interpreting or explaining away what we're seeing in the moment. So if someone was to say, oh, he's fine, he loves the dog park, they would be basing that on their prior experiences, their dog's prior experiences at the dog park. Maybe really the dog does go to the dog park every single day and has a really good time, okay? But what this dog is saying right now is not the same. Um, as a dog trainer, I see a lot of people pick up a small dog and hold it out face to face to small children and say that their little dog loves children. And I can see really clearly that their dog does not want to be put face to face with a small toddler. Um, so be very, very, very careful. This is the probably the biggest thing that holds humans back from understanding what their dogs are saying is our natural tendency and desire to interpret 
based on what we think is happening or past experiences. And sometimes, often, we're wrong, okay? So everybody should be watching their dog in this very moment. And whatever moment it is that you are paying attention to your dog's body language, that is how they are feeling that moment, regardless of how they felt in the past. Um, most of the time, I can go to an amusement park and I love the craziest roller coasters. But if one day I go to the amusement park and my stomach is feeling a little queasy, I may not want to go on a roller coaster. And forcing me to go on a roller coaster on a queasy stomach is a really bad idea, even though in the past I have gone on all the big roller coasters, right? The dog can't say, hey, my stomach's a little upset today. I'd rather not run around at the park, <laughs> okay? Or, hey, you didn't see it, but last time we were here, that big dog over there growled at me and he's here again today and I'm nervous, right? That's the benefit that humans have. We can communicate verbally like that and it's so much easier. We have to do the best we can to interpret our dog's body language. And a major part of that is not putting our assumptions um, or interpretations or especially what we want to have to be happening onto the behavior that we're seeing in the dog. Laura, we had a question. Yes, what is it? Um, if if you had a case where it was puppies and they're kind of acting afraid, would that be a case you'd give them some treats, uh, something that they like, um, so that it would help them? Get yeah, used to yeah, I would. So there's a couple of things. If if your dog is in this situation, the first thing you can do is look around and see if you can figure out what's bothering them, and then you can say, okay, here's some treats. Does this make you feel better? And then if you see something specific that they're worried about, maybe you create some distance. If you're five feet away from the garbage truck and that's what's bothering your puppy, maybe can you give them treats right there? Okay, no, maybe they're still scared. Well, maybe you go 15 feet away and try treats there, right? But in the end, the bottom line is that you have to address the dog's fear and concerns. You can't just dismiss them and say something like, oh, well, you're going to have to learn to get over that. Well, yes, it would be great if they got over that, especially since, you know, your trash truck comes every week. Um, but you were going to want to absolutely address it in a way that helps the puppy and not just say, okay, well, you're going to have to deal with it. So yes, giving treats, providing distance is a huge, um, a, hu a really big, easy way um, for you to alleviate the pressure on the dog and then work to get them adjusted to whatever it is that they're worried about. And often treats happen. I know that if I'm having a bad day and I'm in an angry mood, a big bowl of ice cream makes me feel better sometimes. Um, but be, be prepared that maybe the treats aren't going to be good enough in that situation because if um, I've just been in a car accident, and somebody brings me a pint of ice cream while I'm waiting for the ambulance to arrive, that is not going to help, okay? So sometimes treats will help, and sometimes treats won't, depending on the em internal emotional state of the animal. Laura, will you also address if this is true for both adult dogs and puppies? So I see Esther's question. Um, yes, what I just described will work for both adult dogs and puppies. However, adult dogs, I see the question is, will it help during adult dog socialization? Unfortunately, the socialization or the sensitive period for dogs closes between 12 and 16 weeks. So socialization isn't really something that happens in adult dogs. What happens in adult dogs is something um, completely different, which is called um, habituation, right? So maybe the dog is afraid of the garbage truck and by creating distance and treating and being really nice and allowing the dog to approach and move back whenever they want to, the dog can become habituated. It's not exactly the same thing as socialization, but it is, it does follow basically the same rules. The bottom line is that you want to get the dog into a state of feeling emotionally better 
so that they can think and evaluate, oh, hey, that trash truck is loud, but it's not coming near me. And every time it shows up, I get lots of treats. So yeah, that absolutely does work for adult dogs as well. Um, what we do know is that with adult dogs, it takes a lot longer and it's a lot harder to overcome some of these things. But I would absolutely do the same thing in both situations. I hope that helps, Esther. Um, and, you know, again, just just judge by what you're seeing right now and act accordingly and try to let go of your assumptions or your explanations. And, and the first thing that should matter is what you're seeing in the moment. So I talked a little bit before about um, what we've been working on with the apprentices at Woofs and um, how to understand what your dog is saying. And there are lots of parts to a dog, right? So these are the main things that we wanna watch. We wanna watch their mouth, their eyes, their ears, their head, their body, and their tails. Um, so all of those things come together as once. And um, gosh, I, I don't think I'm gonna attribute this correctly. Um, but somebody said, like, read the whole sentence right? If you're just looking at the mouth, but not the tail, you're just getting a, a word or two, right? You want to read the whole sentence. You want to look at the entire dog from mouth to ears to body to tail. And you want to make sure that you're looking at the entire dog um, because they will use all of their body parts to tell you what they're talking about um, or what they're feeling, what they're saying. And and just because the tail is up or just because the tail is down doesn't always mean the same thing. You have to watch the specific body parts in context with the rest of the dog. So I can tell you that a down tail means the dog is scared or concerned. Except has anybody had a puppy or an adult dog that has the zoomies and they kind of tuck their tail and scoot really fast like they're their back legs come up in front of the front legs and they just scoot around the dog park and this crazy exuberant thing, right? Um, we, in that situation, the dog's tail is tucked, but the dog is happy and, and, and having a grand time. So you can't always look at just, you can't ever look at just one body part. And there is never just one interpretation of a down tail or one interpretation of ears back or one interpretation of a closed mouth. You have to listen to the entire sentence, look at the entire dog and have them tell you what they're saying. In behavior, there are no absolutes, right? You can't say, well, his ears were back. And of course, as trainers, when, what is the most common behavioral inter misinterpretation that we hear? He bit me, but I don't understand. He was wagging his tail. Haha, <laughs> wagging tail, as I will show in some video later, is not always a sign that the dog is happy. A certain type of wag is absolutely a danger sign, right? So again, we want to look at the whole dog. Um, so we're going to look at some dogs. We're going to start with a bunch of still pictures and then um, depending on how much time we have, I will move on into um, some videos that we can watch. So here are three happy dogs, and I hope everybody can see that right away. Um, there's a very happy German Shepherd, which I thought was very important since that really angry faced dog was also a German Shepherd. I wanted to make sure that the happy German Shepherds were represented today. Um, a little happy, I don't know, mixed breed something or other at the bottom and a happy little border collie on the right. So I'm going to point out some of the similarities between these three dogs. Uh, the two prickier dogs on the left both have their ears held up nice and high. Um, the shepherds are really right centered over the head and that little happy dog at the bottom has his ears kind of out to the side a little bit. And the border collie has floppy ears, but they're forward or sitting right in the middle of his head, not too far forward towards his eyes and not too far back towards his neck. All three dogs have 
open mouths, but they have happy open mouths, right? As compared to an open mouth that is baring teeth at you. These are soft, relaxed mouths, almost as if the bottom part of the jaw just kind of fell open and it's just kind of hanging there. It's not being held there in any kind of tension. Um, hopefully you all can see that all three dogs have what we would call almond shaped eyes. Their eyes are kind of almond shaped. They're soft. There's no furrowing of the brow in between the eyes. Um, these are all the things I look at. The dog in the bottom, the, the white and tan dog, looks like he's got a curly tail, which is being held in a neutral position. I can't tell what that border collie on the right's tail looks like. Uh, but that German Shepherd looks like his tail is held down in a down neutral position, right? It's not high up over his back and it's not tucked. Looks like it's just kind of hanging there again, kind of like it's just like, I'm just going to sit here because I don't really have anything to say right now. Okay. Um, is not using his tail very much to communicate at this moment. So these dogs um, just look kind of happy to me. And I wanted to start with some happy dogs. Um, and just point out the similarities. And again, in still pictures, it's tough, but I just wanna look at all the different features that make up what we know to resemble a happy dog. Okay, so again, here's the shepherd. We can look a little bit closer. Almond eyes, up ears, open mouth, kind of comfortable. I love this picture, this dog is so happy almond eyes the other thing i want to point out in this in this photo is you don't see any of the white of the dog's eyes right a lot of times when dogs um are stressed they give something called whale eye where whale as in the large ocean going creature um you'll you can see a lot of the whites of their eyes and it's not just filled with color and that is a warning sign so the fact that i don't see hardly any white in this dog's eyes tells me, yeah, soft, expressive eyes, soft, easy mouth, nice open ears. I'm going to go back to the shepherd real quick. Yeah, no white there, hardly at all either. And then our little border collie friend can see some white in the corner of their eye. And so this is a great, wit, great time to interpret. So I just said white in the corner, right in the corner of their eye can be a sign of stress or concern or anger or fear um but you can't look at one part and say oh i saw the white in this dog's eyes he's stressed this dog is absolutely not stressed um i'm sorry i'm so used to interactive audience i'm going to um ask a question what is another reason you might be seeing the white on this dog's eyes since we're not really that interactive, I'm gonna tell you the answer. The dog is looking up and to the right. So it's just the position of the pupil based on where the dog is looking um, that shows the white in this dog's eye. So that's just a good example of how looking at gravity, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yes, Barb, looking up. <laughs> so the reason the dogs, you can see a little bit of white in this dog's eyes. It's because he's looking up and it's just the position uh, that the dog is looking in that shows the white. So you never ever want to just say, well, I saw the whites of his eyes. That meant something bad. It absolutely does not. Everything in context. All right. What is this dog saying? Let's see. Uh, this dog is super stressed out. And let's start with the similarities, open mouth, but not quite as wide open as the other dogs. Looks like he's holding the, um, the lower jaw up a little bit. And I hope you all can see those big clown smiley wrinkles at the corners of that dog's mouth. Um, those are absolutely stress signs, right? Very serious stress lines at the corner of the dog's mouth where the upper lip and the bottom lip come together. Yeah, Tina, give me space. Why are you hugging me? 
um, that that part of the dog where the upper lip and the bottom lip come together is called the commissure. And those commissures are really um, pinched, let's say. Yep, why are you holding my head? And then you all can see that this dog's eyes are more round than almond shaped. And again, here's a dog who apparently has lost his ears in some horrible accident. No, that was a bad joke. He just can't tell where his ears are because they're pinned so far back, right? And those little brown um, eyebrow spots are definitely drawn into the beginning. Yeah, the eyes look sad. I would agree with that. But what this entire dog is saying is, why are you hanging on me? I don't like this. Chances are they were trying to get a photo. So this is a dog that is definitely not happy. Does this look like a dog that's going to bite? No, it doesn't. But it might try to wiggle out and duck its head under the arms to get away. Um, and those are all the things that I'm looking at to try to say, hey, this dog doesn't look happy to me. Oh, this poor puppy. Again, no ears or tiny little ears, pinned back, round eyes. We don't have the, the clear eyebrow furrow here. Um, so we don't have that, but we do have a closed mouth. Um, and you can tell that this puppy looks a little bit hunched in like he's trying to make himself a little smaller or maybe um putting his head forward in an appeasement gesture to say hey would you take me home or would you give me a treat or please don't hurt me or something like that yeah this dog is definitely scared the begging face i don't know it could be this dog looks a little more unhappy than than begging, I would say. Um, frightened and confused are the eyes. The eyes are just dark, but they, I don't see any whites, but they're nice and round. Um, I would say this dog is concerned at best, scared at worst. Yeah, the mouth is really tight. Um, Erica points that out, right? So again, the mouth is open and that bottom jaw is just hanging down. You can tell that it's kind of just sitting there and the dog is happy. This jaw, this is a clenched jaw. That mouth is really closed tight. Thank you for that. Oh, and then we get to the lovely, lovely photos of children and their dogs. Yeah. So people might see these on an ad or something like that or, you know, used for like, hey, buy our dog food. Look at how happy it makes your dog. Okay, let's break this down. That golden retriever, unhappy, right? And I, I really like this picture for a couple of reasons. You can see that, I guess that's the dad and he's looking at his son and they both got kind of squinty eyes. And I think the little girl there, so the dad's looking at the son, the son is looking at his sister. Sister's got her arm on the dog. Where's the dog looking? Is the dog actually part of that? <laughs> that little uh, grouping? Absolutely not. That dog is like, hey, photographer, you're creeping me out. <laughs> like, why do I have to be held here? I don't want to be held here. Right? And I think it's really interesting to see them all kind of looking at each other and, and being together. And that dog is not even looking in that direction. Yeah. So um, closed mouth, stressed, furrowed eyes um i can't zoom in very well well maybe i don't know if that mattered for you all um no it doesn't, doesn't show, show. Okay. um i can make it bigger on my screen maybe you all can do that too but if you look at this dog the mouth is closed the ears are kind of neutral i'll say that but the dog's not super happy to be there it's probably tolerating it probably is a little bit nervous about the photographer is my guess now this is awesome. That little girl is so adorable and so happy. Um, and let's just go to the cat first because I think the cat is like, as soon as she, as soon as she lifts your arm, I'm out of here. Um, but the cat actually looks better to me even than that dog. Okay, so that looks like a corgi or some kind of corgi mix to me. 
Uh, the eyes are round, the mouth is clamped shut. The eyes are kind of blown, right? Like big uh, blown pupils. And those ears are straight back like airplane wings, right? They are just heading back. That dog is so stressed. I don't know if that dog is stressed because he's near the cat or because he's being restrained near the cat or because he's just being restrained. I don't know. But if somebody told me that the next thing that happened is that this dog bit this child in the face, I would not be surprised at all because that dog is out of his mind with stress and just wants to be getting out of there. Yeah, you can even see like the dog's kind of holding his head back. He doesn't want to be anywhere near that cat. Um, you know, and he's being restrained in that position. Um, we all know that when we're stressed um, or in the presence of something we don't like, we have a couple of options, flight, fight, or freeze. I think right now this dog is in a freeze, um, especially because he's being restrained. Now, when the dog comes out of his freeze and he's being restrained, flight is no longer an option, which leaves us with fight, okay? And we never wanna push a dog into a situation where they can't get away from something and then feel that they need to defend themselves. That's a really, really good way to instigate a bite. So I really, it, it drives me crazy when I see um, photos of, of dogs and kids where the dog is really, really uncomfortable. Um, and it's, the photo is designed to be, you know, really happy and easy and, um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's hard for me to see. And then we have this. Screen is frozen, we're having problems. I hope you guys can get back on. Okay, Nikki's still here. All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'll answer some questions for whatever anybody missed. Again, lovely little golden retriever, ears flat down at his side, absolutely not at all looking happy. Closed mouth, round eyes, um, just not looking happy at all. But again, what was this picture designed to be? Oh, you can make that a Christmas card and send it to all your friends who have absolutely no idea what a dog's body language is trying to tell them, right? So again, this is supposed to be a cute picture of a girl and her dog. And all I see is a stressed out dog. Again, in this, in this situation, a lot like the golden retriever with the family, the dog doesn't look like it's going to bite. Um, it just doesn't look like it wants to be there, you know? Um, but, you know, the kid is really cute. I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to come back to it. Here are some really happy or mostly happy, child and puppy pictures. Here's a little baby crawling. And do you guys see this little bull terrier? Mouth is open, really relaxed. Ears are up and comfortable. Tail is really high. Sometimes we call that flag tail. And flag tail can sometimes be a warning sign but given all the other body language that this puppy is showing, that flag tail is just, hey, I'm excited, I'm, I'm, I'm outside, I'm following my little baby, dog, baby child, uh, I'm pretty happy. So again, no one thing tells us how the dog is feeling. You can see that that right front paw is lifted because he's walking forward. That tells me um, the dog is moving in a relaxed way. He's not stiff. Um, the head is turned to the side. It's not straight and aligned along the spine of the body. And I was going to say something else. I can't remember what it was. The dog looks easygoing. It does have a line 
on its face between the eye and the nose. Not quite sure what that is. Um, but again, given everything else I'm seeing here, I'm not going to worry about that. If I saw that line and the mouth was closed and the ears were forward and the body was straight and stiff, then I would be much more concerned about that line. Yes. Um, Jean says almond eyes. Absolute. The dog's feet are mirroring the baby. I didn't even catch that. That's awesome. Yes. They're learning how to walk in step or crawl in step. That's adorable. This is a happy puppy. What do you see here about this dog and this child as opposed to the, the first few photos I showed? Stinky diaper. Sure, could be that. Um, the dog's not being restrained by the child. The dog is free to come and go. It is free to come near the child. It is free to move away from the child. The child is not grabbing at the puppy, right? Everybody is looking pretty good. We have another one. Again, this picture reminds me so much of that little girl with the dog and the cat, except what we have here are two happy puppies. And again, the girl is not restraining those puppies. Uh, Rhonda, I will talk about um, alignment in a, in a second. Um, again, the dogs aren't being restrained. They're choosing to be with her. Who knows? Maybe somebody put some peanut butter behind that little kid's left ear and that puppy is look, licking it. I don't care. The point is, is that the dog is there of its own volition. They probably like place the puppies there, really quickly took a picture, and then the puppies scatter because that's what puppies do. Um, but whatever, they're not being restrained. They're being allowed to move freely and go where they want. Um, both dogs have almond soft eyes. Um, now again, the dog on the right who's sniffing the little girl's ear, mouth closed, but in this situation, this is not a concern because everything else about the dog is saying we're okay. Also, it does look like the dog is sniffing and when dogs sniff, they do tend to close their mouths in order for most of the air to pass through their nose um, instead of through their mouth. So the mouth closed in that situation is just due to the action of the dog sniffing. I'm gonna take a quick break for some water. So we have a puppy, um, one puppy with the mouth open, one puppy with the mouth closed, but they're still both happy. Um, let's see, Rhonda, uh, that puppy that's sniffing that girl's ear, you can see how the puppy's body is not aligned, right? Um, and a line dog, you can draw a straight line from the top of the head, down the neck, along the spine, and up to and into the tail. It's just gonna be a straight line. The head, the body, and the tail all are just points on a line. This dog is curved, turning its head to the right, um, even the puppy that's standing is curved and has got his head turned to the side. Yeah, the tail on the left could be wagging. We're going to talk more about alignment um, in some of the video we see. So again, not restrained. This last one is super, super interesting. As a standalone photo, you might be concerned. Um, or you might not. This one is sort of iffy. It can go either way. What do I like? Um, the child's not holding the dog. She's got her hands under the dog's chin. The dog seems to be stretching his neck out towards the child to get a good sniff. Um, the body does look aligned, even though I can only see the first half of the body, but that head, neck, and spine are aligned. But again, we don't want to take any one characteristic and say that the this is what the dog means. Um, the dog is lying down. You would think that if it wanted to get away, it would get up. I think I can see some pretty soft eyes in there. Jean says she doesn't love the mouth. Yeah. I can see that. I think this one is iffy, right? Um, but I think overall,
overall it looks relaxed. If I didn't know the dog and that was my child and my child didn't know the dog, I would absolutely get my child out of there. What I will tell you is I purchased most of these images off of Shutterstock and there's a whole series with this Roddy and this child and the other 10 of them, they both look wonderfully, adorably happy, right? So again, a snapshot in time doesn't always tell you the whole picture. Um, and again, I would say that this dog doesn't look terrible, doesn't look like a great situation, but I wouldn't expect anything horrible to happen in the next two seconds, especially since the dog obviously um, has the ability to get but go away. Um, and again, the only reason I know that this was actually really um, a, a friendly relationship is the other pictures in the series. So, but an interesting, I, I like this photo because, you know, sometimes in a still photo, you really can't tell. Um, and still photos is literally a, an instant, a half a second. I don't know if there's any photographers can tell me how long it takes, um, you know, how much time a still photo captures. But it's a very, 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 very small amount of time. Trisha says, don't most of us give tiny toddlers a pass? Absolutely and not. No, toddlers get bit all the time. Most dogs dislike toddlers immensely. And I'm going to answer that right now because I think that's really an important thing to remember. Uh, when in doubt, toddlers stay away from dogs until you absolutely know the dog and the toddler are going to get along super cautious in those situations. Okay. Um, so those three images of kids and dogs, the one thing they do have in common is that the children are not restraining the dogs. The dogs are clearly relaxed. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, compare and contrast some things. So everything I've showed you up until now has been dog to human body language or just dog body language. And then we open the floodgates into the next area of interest, which is dog to dog communication, right? I want everybody who wants to learn more about, about dog behavior to start with a dog you know and yourself and start examining the dog's behavior in response to you. When do they wag their tail? When do they duck their head away? When do they turn to the or heads to the side away from you when do they put their head directly in front of you um because dog to human behavior is easier to understand than dog to dog behavior this dog to dog behavior is highly problematic okay um first thing i see is both of these dogs are on a tight leash right um, and they are meeting full frontal, absolutely nose to nose. Um, both of them have their mouths closed. Both of them have their necks sort of tense. Both of them look pretty aligned to me, even though I can't see the rest of their bodies. They are staring in each other's eyes. What is the best way um, what is the way that friendly dogs greet each other? It is nose to butt, nose to butt, right? They make this cute little circle. Everybody turns around and around um, and they sniff butts because sniffing butts is the dog equivalent to a handshake, right? It's the, actually, it's the polite way of greeting. This head to head is very um, adversarial, very confrontational. Most dogs will choose not to greet face to face given a better choice um, unless they take exception to the other dog, then they might directly go up to his face. What I don't know is how much the leashes are preventing these dogs from giving a polite greeting. So I don't know whether these dogs actually are trying to be impolite um, and aggressive towards each other, 
or if it's just the leash that is causing it. In any case, the leash certainly isn't making the situation better. Both dogs are on really tight leashes um, and are straining towards each other. So this to me, this could go either way. If these dogs went rah, 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 in the next instant, I would not be surprised. Um, if they disengaged from the nose to nose and went side to side around and sniffed each other's butts, I'd be pleasantly surprised and pleased. Um, so Catherine Day, I'm glad you're here. A sharp photo is one 250th of a second or faster. Wow. Yeah, that's no time at all. Um, yeah, the tails in the situation um, could also tell me a lot. So, um, but I think I've seen enough with the faces to be perfectly honest. <laughs> uh, Teresa, that's a great question. Is it safe to let the leash loose to greet a strange dog? Uh, that's a whole other topic. Um, yeah. Jean, Jean also asked about the three second rule. Three second rule for face to face. No, I don't like that rule. I mean, three seconds is good. If, if it looks like in those three seconds, things are going to go south, then I would drag them away. Uh, my option is to always let it proceed at the dog's pace, if at all possible. Um, so I don't, yeah, I mean, I guess the three second rule is good because if you see it going south, you can pull them away. But if things are going well, I, I would say no reason to pull them away. Um, and a lot can happen and a lot of bad things can also happen in three seconds. So I want to go back to the slide that I skipped. Yeah. And I want to talk about, sorry, we got to go look at all these adorable kids and their puppies. Previous, previous, what's going on? I'm getting the same slides. There we are. So I've talked about a lot of different body parts and I wanted to just give you a list of some of the important signals that you should be looking for. Um, I started with some of the, the signals that mean easygoing good things, like a loose body. Um, a loose body is bouncy, off balanced. Um, I mean, normally what I do is I demonstrate at this point. So if y'all can see me, right, if I'm like, hey, right? That's a loose body. If I'm like, hey, that's a stiff aligned body, right? So when I see a loose body on a dog, I'm thinking, okay, that dog's relaxed and happy. Open mouth, generally a good thing, unless of course you've got the snarl, but we always want to look open mouth, closed mouth. Um, we saw at least one paw raise. Um, a single paw raise is a, a, a lovely gesture from one dog to the other. Um, we want to look at the soft eyes, the almond eyes, uh, no wrinkles in between the eyes. Uh, we want to pay attention to dogs that are sniffing. Uh, we want to pay attention to shake offs. And we're going to, I'm going to point all these things out in the video that we're, we're going to watch. Um, head turning away, um, yawning, a freeze. A freeze is very dangerous. Um, so everybody should notice freezes or micro freezes in their dogs um, and be warned. An aligned body, like I said, the head, the neck, the spine and the tail all sort of in a straight line. A lip lick or a, or a tongue flick, you know, just a dog going, mm, mm, you know, we'll see a bunch of those. And then scratching out of context. So sniffing and scratching and yawning are three things that you only need to observe if it's out of context. If it's 1030 at night and your dog just went on a five mile run and you bring them in and they lie down on their yawn, uh, on their bed and yawn, they're probably tired. If they're at the dog park and they've been scuffling with another dog and playing really rough and a little bit on the edge and they stop and yawn, I doubt they're tired, right? My guess is that in that context, the yawn means a calming signal or a stress signal, okay? Same thing for sudden sniffing, right? Do two dogs will meet, they'll sniff each other, and then one dog will immediately start sniffing something super interesting on the ground. Well, 
that could be a sign to the other dog, hey, I don't mean any harm. I'm not here to fight with you. You know, the dog may start sniffing to indicate um, some appeasement to the other dog that for some reason they got a bad feeling from. The last one is scratching. And I will say that sudden scratching, most of the time when I see this as a trainer, is during a training session. Um, you ask your dog to sit and down and stand and spin right and give me your paw, and suddenly the dog stops and has an urgent need to scratch at their collar or somewhere on their body. In that environment, that is usually a stress response. They don't suddenly have all these itches during your training session, okay? So keep in mind that when you're interacting with your dog and they suddenly have, you know, sort of an urgent itch issue that you might be stressing them out a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead and we are going to um, pause just for a minute. If anybody needs a bathroom break, what time is it? 3.02, exactly an hour. Perfect. Um, and then I'm going to give everybody like 30 seconds. I'm going to have some water and then we're going to jump into some video. Um, um, oh, how do I get out of the chat? <laughs> oh, here we go. Videos. And I have a list. Where's my list? All right. We are going to watch some video. I can um, stop the video and restart it, which I might do a couple of times. Oh, I don't know if this is going to work. If anybody, um, Erica, can can you see the files section? Can you all see files? Um, I can see it. Let's see if um, do you guys have access to you guys no? should think to files? There's nothing I in there. I don't hear anybody. Can you hear me? Laura, can you hear me? Okay, we're not going to worry about it. I'm just going to go directly to, thank you guys. Um, no files. That's okay. All right, I'm going to go to my videos. This first video, play video. I want my slide to go away. Okay. Let me set the stage for you. Back in the before times, we used to hold puppy parties on Saturday mornings, and puppies under 16 weeks could come and get some socialization with uh, meet new people, be in a new environment, and meet other puppies. This little black and white border collie is there on his first day, or her first day. I do not recall that little doodle if it was his or her. I think it's her first day or not. Um, but what we see here right from the start is the Border Collie rubbing, turning over and showing its belly and getting belly rubs. I'm not even sure if that's the Border Collie's mom or not. So the first thing we notice is an appeasement or a submissive gesture from this Border Collie to the person saying, I'm a worm, give me some love. I need some, I need some support. And then we're just gonna watch the rest of this. Turning head away, low, waggy tail. Look at that little doodle. Uh, Turn head, but up tail. Sorry, the video is not very good. Border collie, ears back, mouth open, ears forward, ears back, tail low, tail neutral, tail low, ears forward. Those are called airplane ears. Ears back, tongue flick, tongue flick. Ears back, ears forward. Oh, interested? A little reaching out to sniff. Little doodle's like, oh, finally, paw raise on the doodle. Nice neutral tail um, wagging on the doodle. Border collie sitting. Oh, doodle wants to play. Gives a little play bow. We're gonna sniff, sniff, sniff. Ears are back. Tail is not wagging. Low wag from the border collie. Okay, uh, neutral wag from the little doodle. 
walking, low tail, looking for help from the people. All right, short video, a lot going on, okay? So y'all could see just in that little short video how quickly um, that Border Collie's behavior was changing. Sometimes the tail was up, sometimes the tail was down, sometimes the ear was forward, sometimes the ears were back, like constantly changing and communicating to that little doodle, reaching out and sniffing, um, doing a little tongue flick. I'm gonna um, bring that up again. Sometimes it's really worth uh, watching these videos more than once. And it is really good sometimes to watch them in slow motion. So the bottom line here is that little doodle is ready to play. Totally confident, willing to engage, but not being pushy about the Border Collie. Border Collie saying, I'm scared. I'm gonna go look to people. I'm gonna look at people, see if they'll give me attention. Person, will you help me? Right? Trying to figure out what's going on. Those licks, not licking his lips for no reason. It's a little bit of stress, or a lot of bit of stress, actually. Now, the doodle's looking away. The border collie gets brave. Doodle's got his paw up, saying, I'm not going to hurt you, friend. Border collie's like, OK, I'll sit here. Not sure what to do next. Ears are back. Doodle's like, we should play. Border collie's like, I'm not sure. Oh doodle's tail never stops, right? Border collie's tail is constantly down. Right? So the little border collie in this situation is scared. First time socializing, not sure what's going on. Walking over to the people at the end there with their with his ears back, trying to figure out, hey, you know, what should we do? Um, I don't have the video, but I will tell you that within a few minutes that border collie was playing with that little doodle. Um, is everybody able to see that? BC wasn't happy. Um, yeah, the BC was nervous. He was just a little scared. It was his first time um, in that environment and wasn't quite sure what to do. Did not have um, a deep uh, socialization history. To just learning how to interact with other puppies. Um, and was doing really, really well after a few times. So I'm going to show you another video. This is a little crazier. I'm going to show this one twice, too. So if you miss anything, don't worry. This goes really, really fast. in my office at work and the red merle dog is my girl zephyr and the blue merle dog i'm not gonna stop it here. let's see let's stop it here the blue merle dog is her brother scuttlebutt and they are playing in my office now, this is absolutely some intense <laughs> body. One of the things I see when I watch this is both of them have loose, floppy bodies. Their bodies are just flying all over the place. Um, Scuttlebutt, the brown uh, black dog, I mean, is throwing himself on the floor a lot. Sorry, I don't know why the video is wrong. She's got him by the neck, but that's okay in this situation. Um, one of the things the red Merle dog keeps doing is jumping onto that dog bed, right? 
And those are little micro pauses. They're micro pauses in the play, which are really, really important. Okay, so she's playing really rough and then taking a break and playing really rough and then taking a break. And those are things that a dog can do. Apparently I can't leave the video paused. Sorry, folks. Um, those are things that a dog will do to indicate that, all right, we're still playing. We can stop at any time. Uh, you know, nothing terrible is happening here. And you can see that when it ends, Jumping on the jumping on the bed, micro pause. He comes after her. He goes to the bed. She jumps on him again. She gets off. She jumps on him again. And then they pause. So at that last moment, she jumped on the bed and he's like, All right, Laura, are you gonna help me out here or what? Because my sister's nuts. Um so that was really rough play. Um Teresa says a good, good, makes a good point. How much should you pay attention to the sounds they are making? Vocalizations during play or during dog-dog interactions, every dog has a baseline. So some dogs are totally silent when they play. They don't make any noise at all. And some dogs are really vocal when they play. Um, these two, when they play together, are really very vocal. And one of the things I know is because there, one of them belongs to me and the other one is the brother that belongs to a friend of mine. Um, one of the things I know about these dogs is what they sound like when they're playing, right? I know what their baseline is. And so if the baseline were to uh, change dramatically, so those dogs were going, rah, 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 rah. if it was to go from, rah, 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 then I would be concerned, right? So what I'm always looking for in vocalizations is a change in intensity from what they normally do when they're playing to faster, louder, uh, more staccato sounds um, like that. So what you want to know is what is your dog's baseline, and then you want to judge um, anything that's happening after that. In this case, those two dogs play all the time. Um, and they always sound like that. Um, but one of the things I wanted you to see from that video was the floppy body. So Scuttlebutt, the, the black dog, he was on his back a lot. Um, but he wa she wasn't pinning him down. He was flopping over intentionally, right? Once he got down, and she, he was down, she was like biting on his neck, but she wasn't standing over him, pinning him, right? Um, so those were two dogs just really, really rough playing like a lot of siblings do. Uh, do they trade off which one is dominant, Rebecca asks. Um, yeah, I guess they do. Um, in that situation, it looked like Zephyr was being a little bit more dominant, but she was also backing off pretty good. So, um, yeah, uh, Trina Tran says one of them dragged the other dog by the neck for a few seconds. Um, so if I didn't know the other dog, I, that would be concerning to a point. But um, in that situation, when one dog has another dog by the neck, I really want to know, I want to watch what the dog that's being grabbed does. Um, I hope you guys could see that when she did have him by the neck, nothing much changed about him he wasn't excessively concerned he didn't start growling or yipping in fear or crying a lot right nothing much changed um which again indicates to me that he was okay with it um patricia says uh they were also swapping advances and retreats that is so so important um, one way to know that dogs are playing is that there is a give and a take and one dog will come forward and then the other one will come forward and then it'll come back. We always want to look for reciprocal behaviors, um, and consent, right? If 
the dog comes forward and this one backs off and comes forward again and backs off and forward and the one is constantly backing off, that may not be a good situation. But because you're looking for this give and take and this reciprocal mirroring behavior, that's what tells you this is pretty safe in this environment. Okay, really good points, everybody. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, Gwen says, Gwen or Gwen, sorry, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Gwen, I bet. Um, their tails stay loose or happy, right? Nobody ever tucked their tails. So this is great. We're watching their loose bodies, their tails, their mouths, um, the vocalizations, all of this together, even though it is rough. Some people may not be comfortable with it and interrupt it, which would be totally acceptable. Um, but in the end, these dogs were playing really nicely. Um, I am going to, I have some freezing um, in one of the new, in one of the later videos. Okay. Um, what's my next one? Maxwell and Doodle Max. So hold on one second. Um, I'm going to play this video. But I'm going to play it without sound. I'm hoping you guys can't hear this. Max. So the black cocker spaniel is, is Maxwell. Confusing. I know. And the big Come on. That's enough. doodle is Good also Max. 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 We've got trying Max to walk the cocker and Max the doodle. I know. And both of you. Max. And I don't know who the brown dog is, but it doesn't matter. There you go. Max's go tail is wagging. He's moving around. You guys see that aligned posture? You see the white dog turning its ball. head, low tail wag, lip lip. Right? Where's the ball? All of Where's those were warning signs. Maxwell the cocker was not playing. There was no play happen happening. I'm starting it over. Maxwell. You see, let's pause okay look at maxwell the cocker aligned and stiff right from his head to his neck along his spine to his tail we have alignment the doodle on the ground is oh this is annoying the doodle on the ground is kind of maxwell. off center right um, but Black Maxwell is aligned, and if we go from there, the doodle is like, hey, let's play, Hi. and Maxwell, look at that alignment with this that tail wag. This is I know. All right? That was also a freeze. I'm going to see if I can go back. It's kind of hard here. Let me see if I can go back. I want you guys to see that freeze after the doodle gets up. It's going to come up Maxwell. right Maxwell. Laura, I don't Something think you can pause it. On. Uh, okay, here the doodle Max. gets up. The tail is wagging friendly. Maxwell's tail. And Max is like, you stand right there Come and on. don't move. That's enough. Okay. Good boy. Uh, I'm going to play this one last time with the sound. Max. Come on. Max. This is very confusing. I know. But that freeze. Come on. That's enough. Good boy. So, in that situation, the cocker is not happy at all with that doodle. And he wants him to, yeah, Maxwell is totally trying to control the interaction. Um, the wagging tail on the spaniel nothing it means all right so it's interesting because that kind of wag that wag is the tail is up and instead of going like swish swish oh i'm so easy going it's going oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah okay that's the kind of tail wag that even though it looks like they're happy and wagging their tail you really have to be worried about um now sometimes um there's a brief moment when his owner calls him and his tail 
changes. It's still wagging, but he's wagging in a happy way to his mom. And then he goes back and goes out with the doodle again. Um, so you have to look at the entire body language. I'm going to play that again. because It's really interesting to watch. Stiff, aligned. Back. Really, this I'd rather you not move. And then watch. Look at that stiff tail. I wag. Stiff tail. Look at that tail when it's Back. low. He's trying to walk away. His tail immediately goes neutral and wags. It's neutral and wagging now. And then he goes go. back to the Long doodle the and it's up. Right? Now it's neutral. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to come back to the doodle. He's stiff, right? Lip, lip, Go find a ball. low tail wag from the doodle. Maxwell walks away that time. Where's the ball? The doodle's like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go jump in the pool. Uh, let me see what happens after this. That's the other brown dog that Maxwell was okay with. I think that's a dog that lives in the home. And now Maxwell is like sniffing around, hanging out. And that doodle is like, I'm out of here. I'm out of Dodge. I, you know, you told me three times, I'm good. I'm going to go hang out on the other side of this really big yard. Um, Yeah, uh, freeze questions. I'm trying not to get into individual dog questions right now. I will answer those at the end. I just want to talk about general body language. Yeah, uh, Paula has a good point. It seems to me the little black dog wanted the doodle to leave and it sure worked, right? That doodle was like, okay, you don't like me. I'm not gonna hang around. Uh, and it worked. The doodle got out of there and Maxwell got to stay where he wanted to. So, but that was aggression. That was the cocker being aggressive towards that doodle um, and saying, I don't want you here. And you can see the doodle's body language was really soft and mushy. It was on the floor, he turned his head, he did a lip lick, had a low waggy tail, right? Maxwell's tail was up high, wagging, you know, really fast. Um, and most importantly, his body was stiff and aligned. That's the one that I see. Um, that's the, the piece of the body language I see most clearly in that situation is the stiff aligned body. Um, let me see what else I have. That's more of Maxwell. What was the next one? Maxwell the doodle klepto splitting. This is a good one. All right, we're going to watch this. <laughs> You see the black and white dog in the center? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't be laughing, but I love this video so much. So there's a red merle dog on the left. There's a Great Dane on the right, okay? And the black and white spotted dog, not the one that's barking, but the black and white spotted dog comes in between the Dane and uh, I think it's an Aussie constantly tongue flicking, tongue flicking, mouth pursed, teeth bared, right? I'm gonna watch it again. Oh, no, wrong one, cancel, sorry. Oh, when, a, when one dog comes in between two dogs like that, we call it a split, so Maxwell is splitting. I think Maxwell and the Aussie on the left know each other, and that Dane is like, hey, just wanted to come say hi. And, and, and Klepto, the black and white dog, is like, no, you can't talk to my friend. Go away. And the Dane says what, right? Even though Klepto is like a third his size, the Dane's like, all right, dude. I don't need to be here. But Klepto's body language is brilliant. Here he comes. Lip, lip, lick, 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 snarl, no teeth, snarl, lick, 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 lick. All right, how about you go that way? Good job, son. Right? I just love that video because Klepto's body language is so awesome. 
it's so clear. Who understood what Klepto was saying? The Dane. Yeah, the Dane is totally like, oh, okay, man, sorry. Didn't mean to step on your toes. I'll just get out of here. And Klepto follows him a little bit. Is like, yeah, and go. Um, so, um, really, really interesting. One of the things I want to say about the body language that we're seeing um, dog to dog. Dogs have a very, very rich body language that they use to talk to each other around aggression or competition. Um, and we call this ritualized aggressive behavior, right? In that situation, Klepto does not want to fight that Dane. And the Dane doesn't want to fight Klepto because fighting is dangerous. Fighting is um, really, really expensive because if somebody gets hurt, you know, that's a problem. And so Klepto is using all of this ritualized behavior to tell the Dane to go away. And it was beautiful. Some people will see that and be like, oh my God, Klepto is such a jerk. Well, Klepto was, I don't know why he felt the way he did, but he wasn't so much of a jerk. He was clear. He was really clear. The Dane understood what he was saying and nobody had to fight in that situation. And that's one of the reasons I really, really, really like that video as well. Um, it's just really clear use of ritualized aggression. The Dane understands those signals. Absolutely. Um, so let's see, what time is it? Oh, I'm kind of over. Okay, why don't we look at one more video? Which one, which one, which one? I want to show, um, oh, resource guarding or fence fighting. Let's see. Let's go with fence fighting. So this is Maxwell again, the little Cocker Spaniel. And there's a Labrador on the other side. Of it. Now, look at his tail. Oh, look his tail is wagging. I'm going to stop it because the barking is super annoying. But that's another example of a dog wagging his tail when in that situation there was absolutely no good things being told from about that dog's tail wagging, right? His body was aligned even though he's up on the fence. The nature of that bark also was quite frantic and quite insistent, right? Maxwell wanted that uh, Labrador gone, okay? He did not want that Labrador anywhere uh, near his fence and he was trying to get him to go away. That's one of the things, um, fence fighting is really dangerous because it builds up a lot, a lot, a lot of frustration. Um, and if Maxwell does get out of that fence and goes after that uh, Labrador, it could be really bad because Maxwell's really wound up. He's really um, a, in a state of high arousal um, and he's worked himself up so that if he does get out, he could bite that other dog. All right, unfortunately, um, I have to stop here because I want to take, uh, have time to get back to a lot of the questions that I didn't stop and answer. Um, Deborah, you want me to show the resource guarding video? Okay, I will show one more video. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. I have two resource guarding videos, but I'm gonna show you this one because it shows two different situations. Again, now, we're out of dog, dog. We're back to dog, human video. You know, that puppy came from a family um, where he bit the young girl. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Let's just watch this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see what this guy does when I try to take his stuff away. So far, it's not so bad. What you got? Am I bugging you? Mm -hmm. 
You guys see that freeze? See the whale eye? The whites of his eyes? Of course, the growling. Freeze, whale eye. <laughs> so you can see how if this puppy goes to a home with a small child, mm -hmm. yeah. bad things are going to happen. Really okay, bad. I'm going to pause that there. That was a puppy that I adopted. I was doing a study on aggressive puppies. And this puppy came to me, I adopted him. Um, and this was the test I was doing with him to see, cause I heard that he was uh, a resource guarder. So I hope you all could see the multiple freezes, the whale eye, the growling, the stiff aligned body, okay? Some people will say, well, you were bothering him while he had a pig ear, you shouldn't do that. Yes, you're right. You generally shouldn't do that. However, I was purposely evaluating this puppy to see what his problems were because he came to me and they said, well, he bit the kid in the house. So I wanted to see what was going on. And you can imagine that this puppy cannot be in the home with a small child, right? Small child has a sandwich, drops the sandwich, the child and the puppy go for the sandwich at the same time, child gets bit, okay? Now for those of the group out there that's gonna be like, well, you made him do that, you made it look bad. I wanna show you the next part. So have you tried arrow on this kind of stuff? She, people, she's fine. Actually, even with her other dog, she's fine too. But with, a, with something high value like this? Uh, See, that puppy's aligned. Because I would love to try not it. at all calm. You get some video of a normal dog, if you don't mind. You got it? Check out this puppy. What's that? She's like, okay, I'll lift your thing. See how she's just wagging her tail and like, I tried. Oh, what's going on? Yeah, her, look at her. Look at that soft, waggy, neutral oh, tail. Is it yours? If I she's sit, like, can I have it? Right. Yeah. And that's a puppy that's okay to be adopted. She asked, you know, she asked politely for it. She sat. Right. None her of tail is constantly going. She doesn't puppy. mind me bothering right? her. Just petting while she's eating. No growling. Her whiskers are so cute. <laughs> Gently taking the treat from me, chewing on it while I hold it without a problem. The other little puppy whose name was Grover, he wanted to take that away. He didn't want to share it with me. He was like, we're going to fight over this and I'm going to take it. This puppy's happy to share with me. She's like, okay, you hold it, I chew. If I take it away. Right? She's like, are you going to give it? No growling. No take. This is a she's dog so that I would good. trust in a home with small children. Huh? The other one, I absolutely I would not. It. Yes, I can. Do you want it back? And I'm playing the, the trade game. So I take it, I give her a treat, I take it back. This is how we work on resource so this guarding. This is a dog that I would trust around small children. If the children will well behave, any dog will bite, right? right? If pushed too far. Okay. So that was my resource guarding video. Um, this isn't about resource guarding, but it's about the behavior differences that you see in those two puppies. The closed mouth on the little, the black puppy Grover, the alignment, the growling, the whale eye, um, the stiffness, all of those things tell you that there's a problem there. And that black and white puppy, Arrow, was totally soft and mushy about that pig ear, right? Totally um, easygoing, willing to share it and let me hold. Um, 
um, you know, perfectly lovely. So, all right. Um, I'm ready for some questions. Uh-oh, why is my computer not? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Erica says she has questions. I need to check settings because you can't hear me. Um, no, Erica, I cannot hear you. I don't know what to do about that. Can you? <laughs> I don't know what to check. All right, so Erica's going to type the questions. What about raised hair? Carol says that's a good one. Um, that raised hair on the back is excitement or arousal. It could be good. It could be bad. So you want to look at other factors in addition to the raised hair. Okay. Um, Erica, Rebecca, interesting that the puppy's aggression increased this time went on. Oh, absolutely. He was getting more and more frustrated um as time went on and i wasn't letting him have the thing that he wanted so he was just gonna fight me more and more granted let me tell you i think that puppy was 11 weeks old um and we did rehab that puppy and place him in a home without children and he's doing great i know who he has um let's see so Jean says her Aussie chatters her teeth. Sometimes it's stress or fear. Should I worry about aggression? No, if you're not seeing, so chattering is an interesting um, behavior and it usually is the same thing as the pilo erection or the hair raised on the back. It's excitement of some sort or another doesn't necessarily have any link at all to aggression. Um, it can, but it, it, it on its own um, is not an aggressive. Um, Male dogs, when they're around a female dog in heat, will sometimes chatter. Um, herding dogs that see a, herd, uh, a flock of sheep that they're not allowed to go and run after will sometimes chatter. So it doesn't on its own mean um, aggression. Uh... Laura, can you hear me? Someone said... All right, so Erica sends me a question from Nicole or Arlene. Dog freezing. A lot of dogs freeze on walks. Once then I turn around because they seem uncomfortable to move forward. No consistency. What did it happen? What is he telling me? Um, not sure about that. So that's a situation where I would like, I can't. So let me say this right off the bat, folks. All of your questions about your own individual dogs, I cannot give you answers that are accurate without seeing your dog in person or on video, okay? Um, so you're describing behavior to me and I understand that, but I have a, I, I, I just can't accurately diagnose it. So anything I'm going to tell you about your dog or, or, or a behavior that you see is a guess based on your description, and that's assuming your description is accurate. What I will say is that some dogs freeze when they see another dog because they want to get into like a pounce mode, and that could be friendly. Um, if you're not sure what your dog is freezing about, I would say, um, you know, the dog is freezing about something. Maybe it's a smell. Maybe a fox was there earlier in the day or something like that. Um, Erica, can I ask you to text me questions? I'm having trouble keeping up. Just my screen. Okay. Um, so it's really hard for me to, to tell you what your dog is or isn't doing in any one specific situation without me seeing them. Um, Erica, I cannot keep up with your questions because there's so much coming in right now. So if you could um, text me or something, that might work better. I'm just going to go down to these questions and start answering them. So, and then Cynthia says the same thing. Sometimes Gracie will crouch on the ground when she sees another dog and then attacks the dog when it gets closer. So Cynthia, I don't know because I don't know if Gracie is attacking out of a playful pounce or if she's... <sighs> Who's sighing? I heard that. Is that you? That was um, me. I don't know if 
she's pouncing <laughs> because she's playful or because she's pouncing for she's aggressive. But if she's crouching and then pouncing in an aggressive way, I would say that the crouch then means that she is going to attack, right? Some dogs attack from a crouch. So I would be concerned and I would redirect her. The dogs that are freezing, again, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, they're freezing for a reason. I would encourage them forward or I would turn around and walk the other way, maybe cross the street. There's something that's going on, um, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, uh, let's see, Leslie has a dog without a tail. Yes, if you dock or, um, or if your dog came docked, ears or tails, um, or was even born without a tail, it makes everything harder, right? You're missing part of the sentence. So that's one really good reason not to dock, if at all possible, um, ears or tails. And then obviously some dogs are born naturally without bob tail or no tail at all. Um, and it just makes it harder. It's just um, one, uh, one less piece of the puzzle that you have to try to see the whole picture. So that's very, very challenging. Um, let's see. When dogs break off what they're doing and just zoom around in circles, what is that behavior indicating? Uh, I, if you're talking about zoomies, that's usually just exuberance, excitement, and they just need to run around and be really excited. Um, a rule of thumb for stopping interaction at the dog park. Um, if you're at the dog park and you don't like what's going on, you should take your dog and you should go home. Um, dog parks are uh, notoriously unmonitored um, and occasionally have aggressive dogs there. And I am not about to try to control somebody else or somebody else's dog. Um, so if I was at a dog park with a dog and I didn't like what was going on, I would leave. Um, my dogs, any dog that goes anywhere off leash should have a rock solid recall. Nobody should bring in their dog to the dog park if you can't call your dog and get them back to you so that you can leash up and go. So if I want to stop an interaction at the dog park, if it's a fight, I will yell. Um, if it's my dog who is not involved in the fight, I will call my dog to me and try to leave. Um, it's just really, it's really a challenge. Um, hi, Mary Klein. Good to see you or hear from you. Checking my texts. I've got questions coming in. All right, let's see. All right. Will the webinar cover different types of barks? Um, no, it doesn't cover different types of barks. Um, Barks are difficult to interpret, I will say that. Um, and every dog is going to be different on their barks. Um, I don't have, I honestly don't have a lot of experience interpreting barks because mostly I use the body language. Um, Rebecca says, does the leash controlled dog culture prevent dogs from learning to sniff butts? Absolutely. Um, there's a really good book by Dr. Patricia McConnell called The Other End of the Leash. And it is about how you as the human are interfering with your dog's ability to communicate and, and how you are um, imposing restrictions and, and um, it's, it's not all negative, uh, sorry to make it sound like that, but it's about acknowledging how we are interfering in our dog's uh, abilities to communicate. Um, again, it's Patricia McConnell and it's called the other end of the leash, meaning your end, not the dog's end. And I would encourage everybody to read it. Um, and I would say that, yes, uh, we often uh, pull back choke up on our dog's leash when they see another dog and that drastically affects the natural behavior that they would normally do when they see each other. Um, if 
at all possible, you should try to keep a loose leash. Um, but you should also evaluate the other dog, the other dog's behavior as they are approaching you. And if there's something you don't like, don't go in with a loose leash, don't go in at all, move in the opposite direction. There's nothing, uh, there's no rule that your dog has to meet every other dog it meets on the street. I don't stop and say hi to anybody when I'm walking along the street, hardly at all, right? I might smile and move along. If I see a friend, I'll stop and chat, but I don't stop and, and sniff butts with every stranger I meet while I'm walking along the street. I've got somewhere to go, I'm on my way. There's no reason why our dog should be stopping meeting every single person. Um, it's just not necessary. Um, Nikki has a good question about body language influenced by color. I don't think so. Um, I think, um, unless the dog looks dramatically unusual. Um, so some dogs have problems with the giant breed. Some dogs have problems with Great Danes or Newfoundlands because it's just kind of out of their wheelhouse. So they're not even sure it's a dog but I don't think color bothers them much at all. Um, so two similar questions from Nikki and Maria. Nikki says she's had her dog a little over a year. He never did a paw raise, but now he does it all the time. Um, it's probably a good thing. And then Maria says her dog wags her tail at other dogs as he sniffs them, but when the other dog goes to sniff him, his tail is sniff and he skips away. Yeah, so, um, so I would say from Nikki, the fact that your dog is doing a paw raise is probably a good thing. It indicates a level of comfort with you and he's trying to say, or, or, um, or the dog is lifting the paw to say, hey, I'm no, I'm no threat. Do you want to play? Let's be friends kind of thing. Maria, I think um, that your dog is in a situation where, um, he wants to be able to sniff the other dogs, but he doesn't want the other dogs to sniff him. Um, and it could just be, um, maybe he's a little insecure. Maybe he's not quite sure what to do. Um, and I would say that if he skips away, then let him skip away, right? We gotta let them do um, what they find it natural to do. Thank you for Erica for putting the name of the book in there. Um, Sneezing, I don't think sneezing can be indicative of emotions because sneezing is an involuntary action and not um, something that they can uh, control. Several questions about how to redirect behavior. So redirect, redirecting behavior is, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it is totally beyond the scope right now of what I'm trying to talk about. But yes, it's really important because the whole reason we want to know what our body, our dogs are saying through the body language is so we can be proactive. Um, I would say if you need to redirect your dog's behavior, um, if they're scared or if they're having an aggressive moment with another dog, the most important thing, um, we call it the get out of dodge move. It's just a U-turn and you walk in the other direction. Um, so if I want to redirect um, a dog who's growling at another dog or something, I will try to create as much distance as possible between me and the thing that the dog is growling at. Um, let's see. Questions about how to redirect. You know, that's that's my main thing in this situation. And then obviously, if it's a sort of a consistent problem, then we would try a more in-depth training program to get the dog to tolerate or learn to accept whatever it is that you need to redirect them from. Um, okay, so Rose has a good point. I can pet my dog when he's eating or chewing something. Um, but if I try to get the bone, he will growl, but not freeze. I feel he thinks I'm playing, you know, I got to say, Rose, I would err on the side of caution. And I would guess that, um, he does not think you're playing and that he is growling at you very specifically to tell you to stop trying to take away his precious bone. Um, and unless I can see that with my own eyes and say, oh my God, yes, he's totally playing. I would be really careful. Um, 
There's a question about dogs, daycare and dog parks make them more skilled or less aggressive. I will be honest, that depends on the experience the dog has. So if you're taking your dog to a good doggy daycare and they are monitoring the play and they are putting dogs with similar personalities and similar play styles together, then your dog will be having a positive experience. It will make them a more nuanced socializer, a more nuanced reader of body language. Um, and that could be very helpful to them. If your dog goes to a doggy daycare and is getting smacked around all day by some bully dogs, then that is probably going to make them more aggressive. Same rules if your dog is at the dog park, right? If they're going to the dog park and getting bullied or aggressed at um, or are aggressing towards other dogs and practicing being aggressive, then that's what you're going to get. Aggre um, practice makes permanent. So whatever your dog is doing, um, most of the time their interactions with other dogs is what they will do in the future. If it's unpleasant, it will remain unpleasant. And if it's friendly and fun, it will probably be fun. I think dogs that socialize a lot have um, more well-developed well social skills for when they do meet a dog that they don't know. Uh, but obviously if they're having negative experiences, that's gonna carry over. Um, that's gonna carry over to you know their future experiences. Uh, let's see, your dog jumps on other dogs. How can I stop that or teach them not to? Um, you probably can't, Saul. Um, uh, that's a behavior that your dog is doing. Um, you can, you can try to call him off and ask him to sit or stand. Um, but if that's what he's doing to other dogs, whether I'm, I'm not sure if it's excitement or aggression, I can't tell just by the question. Um, but you may not be able to teach him not to, uh, if that's what he feels like doing when um, he sees another dog. Oh, Paula says Patricia McConnell also has a blog. Yes, and it is very good. Um, let me see. Nicole asks, any idea why dogs go so crazy for mail and delivery? Ours goes nuts even seeing UPS or FedEx blocks away. Um, and then another question about mail and UPS. My dog will bark and bark, but I will let her out. She's fine if the mailman. Yeah, so um, dogs have a, a clear sense of their property in most cases and do not like it when quote unquote strangers invade their space. And they will let you know when somebody is invading their space. The other thing is um, dogs, a, a lot of dogs, I wouldn't say most, but many, many dogs have a negative association with uniforms. Um, not sure why, uh, but yes, and I think um, in the case, let's see, Andrea, sorry, I'm having trouble keeping up with these questions. I oh, know it was Barb. If she lets her out, she's fine with the mailman because she sees this person on the other side of a barrier and she can't get to them to sniff them to find out if they're friendly to get an idea of who they are and once she gets out and sees that they're friendly she's like oh it's just you i smelled you last week i'm good with that um but yeah dogs have a very well-defined sense of their property and will let you know when somebody who's not supposed to be there or isn't usually there is there and that's a pretty um pretty normal response um patricia has a follow-up about daycare yes in a good monitored daycare your dogs can have very very positive experiences and be uh, maintain good socialization uh, beth says she was feeding two puppies from the same bowl they started growling she changed to two bowls and they'll exchange bowls without growling they're growling resource guarding absolutely it is resource guarding um, I'm surprised to hear that they exchange bowls and I would be concerned that as they get older that might stop and there might be more fights over that. Um, 
but if using their own bowls is fine, I would strongly encourage everybody in a multiple dog household, all dogs should be allowed to eat in peace. And that's whether they have a, a bone, a chewy, a pizzle, a bully stick, or their meal, right? So all four of my dogs eat in separate rooms. Nobody eats in the same room. Nobody needs to feel rushed. Nobody needs to feel um, stressed about getting their food finished before some, someone comes over and steals it. The other thing is you guys saw me petting the dog, those two puppies, when I was testing their resource guarding. I was specifically testing them because that puppy um, Grover was, was told to me to be aggressive around food. So I was doing a test. I do not, or nor do I ever encourage anyone to pet or bother their dogs while they are eating or chewing on a treat. It's just not appropriate. If somebody, um, came and started poking me while I was eating, I'd be pretty darn annoyed too, right? I'm trying to eat, stay away from my stuff. So definitely let your dogs eat in peace. Um, absolutely don't need to be bothering them. We have some questions about tails. Um, Maria says, Pala, she will often give new people a woof or two. Is this Caller the St. Bernard? Um, because she's very big. Um, and when she does this, she will often wag her tail. What might the tail wagging mean in the scenario? Absolutely nothing. I would pay attention to the woof over the tail in that situation. I think the woof is a little bit of a warning to proceed with caution. Um, and the tail, I would say, let's not in that situation think that the tail means everything is fine. I think the woof overrides the tail in that situation. Um, Andrea says her tail, dog's tail is always wagging, so it's hard to tell what he's feeling. So yeah, Andrea, what I always want to do, um, in addition to reading the body language as a whole, you want to look at tails as up, down, or neutral. So when a tail is coming, I don't know how to make this. Oh, wait a minute. Where's my, aha, hold on one second. Everybody meet Goldie. When a tail is coming straight out from the dog like this and just kind of along the spine and then straight out, we call this a neutral tail. Neutral tail is safe. Down tail in an in a interaction can mean scared. This up here, we call this flag tail. And sometimes the tail will even bend and the point of the tail will practically touch the back, okay? So when you're watching a tail, you wanna watch what the base of the tail is doing and look whether the tail is neutral, down, or up. The position of the tail is going to tell you a lot more than, what, than, um, than whether or not it is wagging, right? So neutral means the dog is cool, down means potentially scared or anxious, and up means high alert, possible danger. Okay, we call this flag tail because that that tail is like up like a flagpole, okay? So I would pay more attention to the position of the tail and less attention to whether it's wagging. Although a lot of times what you will see in a, an aggression situation is the tail will be up and wagging very short strokes. I'm not doing a very good job of this. And then to freeze, okay? That's generally a bad sign when dealing with tails. I hope that helped. Um, okay. Uh, I think this is our last question. How about a dog that sniffs other dogs but won't let other dogs sniff her? Yeah, um, you can't stop that, Tina. I'm sorry. I would just try to introduce your dog to a few close friends that she can get used to and not worry about introducing her to a lot of other dogs because it sounds like she is not um, enjoying that. Um, and, and here's what I will say about that. Uh, let your dog be who they are. If your dog doesn't like meeting a lot of other dogs, maybe you just have a doggy introvert and you just need to love the dog you have and do not force them out of their comfort zone. If they're saying, I don't wanna meet other dogs and I don't want dogs sniffing my butt, 
then just be like, you know what? Guess what, honey? Dogs don't need to sniff your butt. It's all good. We're just gonna walk around them and be further away. Um, this is really the final last question. Nikki says, am I going to have another webinar about expanding on body language? Yes, I would love to do an intermediate or a deep dive on body language where we can show a lot more video looking at um, tails and ears and growls and all that good stuff. Like I said, I just, the goal of this in wrapping up was just to introduce you all to what you should be looking at and what you should be studying. Um, understanding body language and dog communication uh, can be somebody's life's work, for instance. Um, so this is just a starting point for you all to start saying, huh, you know, I wonder what my dog is saying. Or some of you who have already been looking at, maybe this can give you a little bit um, more in-depth knowledge. But the bottom line is respect what your dog is saying to you. Listen to what your dog is saying to you. They're constantly, constantly communicating. Um, and respect what they have to say because um, they wouldn't be saying it if it wasn't important to them, okay? And if we love our dogs, we want to know what's important to them and what makes them happy and what makes them anxious and what makes them sad. So the more that we can pay attention to them, the better guardian or, um, you know, partner in crime we can be with our dogs. Um, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you all for being here. It was a pleasure and I hope you all um found something to take away from it have a great day everyone thanks everyone for coming i hope to see you again at another one see you soon <laughs>